Good morning. I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, the Chair of Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Thank you for attending this oversight hearing. Today we will be discussing materials on our waste stream, in our waste stream, that can be diverted from landfill but are not collected for curbside recycling by the Department of Sanitation. We will also hear proposal intro number 1075A, sponsored by the public advocate Letitia James, uh, in relation to an organic waste curbside collection pilot program. DSNY provides curbside collection service for refuse, metal, glass, plastic, and paper recyclables. DSNY also collects food waste for organics recycling in certain community districts. And we expect that this, that this program will be expanded citywide in 2019. Uh, proposed intro number 1075A would create a pilot program for organics recycling in buildings including city agency. The bill also mandates education and outreach in those buildings that will participate in the program. I hope that DSNY will be able to see what works and use that information to educate the public about residential organics recycling as the program expands to more community districts. According to the 2017 Waste Characterization Study, there is a significant portion of our waste stream that is picked up as refuse but could potentially be diverted from landfill. These materials include electronic waste, textiles, harmful household products, and plastic shopping bags. If we're going to meet our goal of achieving zero waste to landfill by 2030, we need to understand the waste stream and create actionable plans for each of the materials. Today, I hope to get an update on how the city is working to create accessible programs to promote recycling, reuse, donation, or proper safe disposal for these items. We need to do more than just create the programs to divert these materials though. The city needs to reach out to communities and teach people about the programs available to them and the best way to keep these materials out of the refuse stream. Without <coughs> proper education and outreach, participation in these programs and our progress towards zero waste will likely be disappointing. I look forward to hearing testimony from DSNY, environmental advocates, and other interested groups about their experience with the current initiatives to divert materials from the waste stream so far, um, so far, and any advice that they have for how the city could be doing to engage with communities. I will now turn it over to the public advocate who would like to speak about her bill. Public advocate Letitia James from Brooklyn. Uh, good morning and thank you uh, Chairman Renosa and members of the committee for convening this hearing today. Um, my name is Letitia James and I'm the public advocate for about 13 more days. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's very fitting that my final city council hearing as public ad um, advocate is a sanitation committee, a committee that I once chaired and is dear to my heart. And I want to thank uh, the commissioner and I want to thank the staff um, for educating me about all of the issues and thank you for working with me and I look forward to working with you in my other capacity. Uh, I'm also um, am proud of all of the work that we've been able to do together, including the advanced initiatives uh, that increase recycling um, and raise awareness of the importance of smart waste practices. I thank you for working with residents of public housing. Um, and I just uh, uh, thank you uh, again uh, for introducing me to the world of uh, sanitation. Um, I will now like to turn to the legislation that's the subject of this hearing. Um, as the public advocate, I serve as the voice for the most vulnerable, and today I'm speak on behalf of the city itself, which is at risk of the devastating consequences of climate change and could find itself submerged underwater in the decades to come. Climate change is one of the most critical issues that we face, and as I um, travel the state, I am beginning to see the effects of climate change, and um, it is very, very real, um, and it's unfortunate that um, our country has now turned its back on, the, on uh, um, the, the devastating consequences of climate change and refuses to accept the realities of it. A recent report from the UN found that we have only 12 years, 12 years to limit the true catastrophic effects of global warming. This should be a sign to all of us that we have no time to waste and that time is of the essence and that we must act now. New York City has set ambitious goals uh, to combat climate change, including uh, sending zero waste to the landfills by 2030 and launching the largest compost program in the country. And given that our organics program is at uh, present voluntary, our public servants should serve as a model to propel a cultural shift on organics recycling throughout the city. Education and outreach will be critical to this program's success. 
Um, in our policy brief, um, we highlighted best practices from San Francisco, which has had mandatory organics recycling since 2009. The city of San Francisco uses zero waste coordinators in each agency and office uh, to support education and compliance efforts. And uh, these uh, zero waste coordinators are city employees who volunteer to serve in the role and receive additional training and support from San Francisco's Department of the Environment to ensure employees understand and follow the organics recycling law. This is a model um, that we should consider using for education, outreach, and compliance as part of the pilot program. Um, I recognize that it will take resources, but I think given, uh, the, given the realities that we face, it's certainly worth it. Um, and we cannot afford to uh, stall uh, the city's organics uh, collection program in light of the impending climate crisis. I urge my colleagues to support this bill. I look forward to the, d the discussion today, and I thank you for this opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy birthday to your little baby boy. It was two days ago. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> it's been a great experience being a dad. Um, everyone says it changes you, and it's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. So thank you for that. Uh, our public advocate for 13 more days, who's going to go on to bigger and better things, uh, protecting us at the state level. We're going to miss you dearly here in the city council, presiding over us. Um, I know your work that you did as the sanitation committee member who's one of the first sanitation committee members from Brooklyn, um, or committee chairs from Brooklyn, um, before no one wanted to see. It was all Staten Islanders that, that took, uh, <laughs> did, did all the work. But once we shut down Fresh Kills, it, it, it got hot again. So thank you again. And I'm looking forward to moving on this bill as soon as possible. Um, so again, thank you for your advocacy. Now we'll allow for uh, Commissioner of Sanitation, D. Captain Garcia. And I need to swear you in, though, just in oh, case. Okay, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and Public Advocate Letitia James for the next few days. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the Department of Sanitation, and I am joined by Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability for the Department. The New York City Department of Sanitation collects more than 3.5 million tons of waste and recyclables each year. New Yorkers are accustomed to source separating traditional recyclables and placing them at the curb for department pickup. This includes metal, glass, cartons, and plastic, and paper and corrugated cardboard. As we continue to improve our curbside recycling rate compared to a decade ago, we also recognize the changing nature of our waste stream and the economic trends that influence how we must plan and identify opportunities to divert other materials from disposal and develop sustainable programs to manage New York City's discards beyond the traditional curbside collection. Earlier this year, we released our 2017 Waste Characterization Study a comprehensive analysis of the composition of our curbside refuse and recycling collections. This study, which the department presented to this committee in May, found that 34% of the waste the department collects is traditional curbside recyclables, mixed paper and cardboard and metal, glass, plastic and cartons. Since the 1980s, we have worked to develop one of the earliest and now the largest mandatory curbside recycling program of any municipality in the country. We now collect more than 600,000 tons of these products per year and capture more than 50% of these designated recyclables in our curbside recycling program. Another 34% of the waste we collect is organics, food scraps, food soiled paper, and yard waste. We have developed the nation's largest curbside organics collection program, serving 3.5 million New Yorkers. Last year, we collected 43,000 tons of organics through the curbside collection program and food scrap drop-off sites, a number that we hope to continue to grow. However, even if we were able to divert 100% of all traditional recyclables and organics into the appropriate curbside collection programs, we would only divert 68% of the waste we collect. That's far from our goal of sending zero waste to landfills. To achieve this goal, we must develop policies and programs to address the other third of our waste stream that does not have a home in the curbside diversion programs. These policies and programs can also help to promote waste reduction and reuse to decrease the overall amount of waste we collect 
and contribute to our zero waste goals. In the last several years, we have implement, implemented new programs and expansions to the services we offer New Yorkers for non-curbside collected materials and the infrastructure to handle it. We take this role as stewards of the city's zero waste goals very seriously, and we will continue aggressively on this path in order to grow these programs. Today, we are incredibly proud of the work we have done so far. In today's testimony, I will highlight several of these programs in place today and some challenges we aim to overcome in the future. New York City has a robust reuse sector comprised of nonprofit and commercial enterprises that collects and redistributes unwanted goods. Reuse is considered to be a higher and better use than recycling, as products can continue to be used for their original intended purpose. These efforts reflect a changing focus. Rather than focusing just on diverting waste for recycling via curbside collection, we are treating discarded materials as an opportunity for us to build industries and develop a local economy around materials that can be recovered. The Department's efforts to track and measure the flow of reused and donated materials in New York City are precedent-setting nationwide. In 2016, we launched our Donate NYC website and mobile app to make it easier for New Yorkers to give goods, find goods, and do good. These tools provide an easy way to find local opportunities to reuse unwanted goods and to directly exchange unwanted goods with organizations that need them. We also provide support to the local nonprofit community to expand their uh, capacities and reach more New Yorkers. In fiscal year 2018, Donate NYC partner organizations together reused 52,000 tons of used or surplus materials. These include more than 31,000 tons of rescued food, 11,000 tons of textiles, 8,000 tons of used goods, and nearly 1,000 tons of electronics. Last year, the department released the New York City Reuse Sector Report, a comprehensive survey of the city's reuse-associated businesses and organizations organizations that includes places that sell, repair, or rent used items. That report found that more than 2,200 businesses with more than 3,600 locations citywide engage in reuse, resale, repair, and rental services, reducing the amount of waste New Yorkers throw away. The department also continues to promote efforts to reduce food waste by encouraging the donation of surplus edible food. Pursuant to Local Law 176 of 2017, the Department is finalizing the development of a food donation portal that we expect to launch next spring. This application will be a new component of our web-based and mobile Donate NYC platform and will increase food donations and recovery from businesses with surplus edible food by matching donor food establishments with food rescue organizations. Clothing and textiles make up 6% of residential waste, and we continue to work with our partners to expand opportunities to donate, reuse, and recycle these items. In, 2017, in 2011, the city launched Refashion NYC in partnership with the nonprofit Housing Works to make clothing donation easy through a convenient in-building collection service. Apartment buildings with 10 or more units can apply to receive a donation bin placed in a common area of the building. Residents put their unwanted textiles in the bin. When it is full, the material is collected and put to reuse. All proceeds from donations support the charitable mission of Housing Works. Today, nearly 1,700 residential buildings with 170,000 households and more than 360,000 residents have refashion bins. In fiscal year 2018, New Yorkers donated 1,900 tons of textiles through Refashion NYC. We continue to the go the, grow the program and have recently worked with Housing Works to add more partners to expand capacity for textile donations, and we are conducting outreach to dry cleaners, laundry mats, fitness centers, and other clothing-related businesses to encourage them to enroll as well. We also support other efforts to donate used clothing. We partner with Grow NYC to offer weekly clothing collections at green markets and to host community scale clothing donation and stop and swap events citywide. And earlier this month, we worked with Goodwill to collect discarded clothing at the New York City Marathon. Although electronic waste comprises less than 1% of the waste stream, electronics often contain toxic materials like mercury, cadmium, lead, and other heavy metals that can be toxic to humans and the environment. 
The department created eCycle NYC in 2013 in partnership with ERI, an industry leader in safe and secure electronics recycling. Similar to Refashion NYC, the eCycle NYC apartment building program is provided at no cost to the city and is available in any building with 10 or more units. It has since grown to be the most expansive and convenient e-waste collection program in the country, serving nearly 14,000 apartment buildings with more than 850,000 households and 1.8 million residents. Additionally, since 2016, the department is also phasing in appointment-based electronic waste collection service for residents who do not live in large apartment buildings eligible for the eCycle NYC program. Today, residents of Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Western Queens can schedule a collection appointment online or by calling 311. This program will expand to the rest of Queens and the Bronx next fall. We also continue to accept electronic waste at our safe disposal events and at community scale electronic waste recycling events hosted in partnership with local elected officials and community organizations. Together, our electric electronic waste recycling programs collected and properly recycled nearly 4,000 tons of electronic waste in fiscal 18. The comparison between the participation in eCycle NYC and Refashion NYC draws an important distinction. In 2015, a New York State law banned the curbside collection of electronic waste as refuse, and the city enacted regulations to enforce this state law. This disposal ban has helped to dramatically grow the participation in each of the department's electronic waste recycling programs. The 2017 waste characterization study showed that the amount of e-waste in our curbside waste stream had declined by 60%. For textiles, a similar disposal ban does not exist and participation in the Refashion NYC program is entirely voluntary. As a result, participation in the program has grown at slower rates and fewer buildings have enrolled overall. Like electronic waste, harmful household products make up a very small share of the overall waste stream, just 0.4%. But these products can pose a danger to sanitation employees on collection and in the transfer station, and they can present a risk to humans and the environment when disposed improperly. The department hosts 10 annual safe disposal events, short for solvents, automotive, flammable, and electronics. At these events, two at each borough annually, New Yorkers can drop off these harmful household products. These products include paint, household cleansers and chemicals, automotive fluid, electronic waste, unwanted medicines, and other potentially dangerous products from around the home. In the last two years, the department has also begun offering smaller pop-up safe events in partnership with local elected officials and community groups. The department also operates five household special waste sites, one in each borough. These sites are open every Saturday and the last Friday of each month. These sites, which are regulated by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, accept latex paint, fluorescent light bulbs, mercury-containing devices, car batteries, and other common special waste products. Together, these programs collect more than 600 tons of household hazardous waste in fiscal year 2018. New York City's waste stream and our non-curbside recycling programs are influenced heavily by state law. The Bottle Bill, more formally known as the New York State Returnable Container Law, is an effective program that diverts a significant quantity of bottles and cans. Bottle Bill diversion represents the diligent source separation of containers by New York residents that are captured not in our curbside collections, but rather through redemption centers. However, because this material is not collected on our recycling trucks, we are not able to count this in our mandated curbside diversion rate. This means that the overall amount of material recycled by New Yorkers and our recycling diversion rate are both effectively much larger than our statistics show. Since the bottle bill was amended in 2012, the deposit initiators are no longer required to report on the quantity of redeemed beverage containers by county in New York State to the New York State DEC, which had until then published them. Each year, we work to get voluntary reporting of bottle bill diversion from redeemers operating in New York City and report this in our non-curbside statistics, but we do not have a full picture. Our partial reporting from fiscal 18 documented more than 50,000 tons of bottles and cans redeemed, and we think that the total number likely is more than double this amount. Several other state laws mandate non-curbside collection programs for various products. The Electronic Equipment Recycling and Reuse Act established the disposal ban that was le has led to the success of our city-run electronic waste recycling programs. 
However, that law, which preempted a similar city law, did not set sufficiently clear or aggressive requirements for electronic manufacturers to fund take back and recycling programs. While New York City has benefited substantially from the extended producer responsibility components of this law, especially in comparison to many upstate counties, cities, and towns, we have been forced to shoulder additional costs associated with our appointment-based electronic waste collection program. In addition, the state has enacted laws requiring plastic bag recycling and rechargeable battery recycling in certain establishments. However, both of these laws create challenges from both the measurement and enforcement perspective. The department continues to advocate for better reporting requirements and local enforcement authority for these and other state-mandated non-curbside recycling programs. Looking forward, the department will continue to seek new and innovative ways to reduce, reuse, and recycle waste through non-curbside methods. There are several categories of waste for which few or no recycling options currently exist. We are excited to finally implement the ban on expanded polystyrene food service products, and we look forward to working with the state and city governments to enact meaningful reform for single-use carryout bags. We will continue to evaluate options to promote reusable or recyclable products, and we will explore options for additional non-curbside recycling programs. In addition, we have increasingly looked upstream in the product cycle to influence the choices that manufacturers, retailers, and consumers make as they create, design, sell, and purchase products. The department has worked with several consumer goods manufacturers, waste management enterprises, and other state and municipalities to work toward a circular economy where products and resources can be continuously reused, refurnished, and regenerated for ongoing use as new products. I now turn to intro 1075, which authorized the creation of a two-year pilot program in no fewer than three boroughs to collect organic material from city offices that receive department collection service. The department currently provides organics collection service in certain city buildings on request and where the collection service is available, including City Hall. We also offer curbside organics collection service at nearly 800 public schools. The department supports the goal of aligning our city government more closely with our zero waste goals, and we look forward to embarking on this pilot to help us study participation rates and tonnage diversion in order to achieve our goal. I would also like to thank the public advocate for sponsorship of this bill and for her ongoing dedication to sustainable waste management, both in her current role and in her tenure as chair of the Sanitation Committee. I am pleased to wish her good luck as she heads to Albany, though I think it's very cold there, to assume the office of Attorney General. And snowier, <laughs> it's actually snowier. <laughs> Together as, I hope they'll let you come back to your city, right? You gotta be back in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. There you go. Together, as we as New Yorkers have an incredible opportunity to achieve our goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030 through a combination of both curbside and non-curbside collection programs. The initiatives I've outlined today place us on a path to achieve this goal, and I thank the administration and the council for their past, present, and future support as the department leads the city on this journey. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to allow for the public advocate to ask questions, and I know she's feeling a little under the weather, too, yeah. so I just want to make sure that if you need to get out early, you can. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Cabrera, Espinal, Deutsch, and Deutsch from the committee. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, there is a bug going around, and I think I caught it. Um, I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your kind remarks, and I look forward to working with you to identify those buildings um, do you have any idea what buildings we, uh, where this pilot program would best work? Um, I, th I think that we would need to work on, on what would make the most sense. I'd actually like to see a variety of different building types so that we can really study what, uh, what works in terms of the outreach, in terms of their setups. Um, so we are thinking that it will be primarily in office buildings okay. uh, that are picked up by the department, um, but that we are open to other locations as well, like for example, um, based on a sanitation worker, we actually recruited a, a food bank not far from our offices in Manhattan, I think because we thought it would help with rats. <laughs> so, and I think that it's gotten a little bit better there. Good. Um, in, you suspended, I guess, the expansion of curbside organics collection. Um, 
was, can you tell me why, and is, is it going to get back on track uh, for further expansion? Uh, so yes, we took a pause uh, at the beginning of May of mm -hmm. this year, um, and our intention is to get back on track. We have been making adjustments uh, in terms of how we collect it, mm -hmm. uh, and so in some districts we were collecting bulk days with the split body truck, uh, which you're probably one of the few people I don't have to explain what a right. split body truck <laughs> is. A and we were having issues with bulk, so mm. we had to change sort of and create a hybrid where at least one of those days we're still collecting with a regular sized mm. rear loader, which has required redoing routes, so that is what we've spent our time uh, sort of mapping out again. But our intention is to get back on track. And is there a report card on how each district is doing with respect to organics collection? So we don't have a report card per se, but mm -hmm. we certainly have data on who is co who is giving us more material, uh, who is participating more, uh, and who is not. So we are happy to provide like the actual raw numbers of, we don't grade it, we don't say, right. oh, this is an A, this is a B, but um, we know which have higher percentages. And is Manhattan leading again? No, because they don't have a lot of curbside. Oh. Um, no. Brooklyn? Brooklyn was, would be better, yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my last question is separate and apart from the legislation is um, medicine. Yeah. Um, uh, can we focus a little bit on that and what efforts are we doing to collect outdated um, medicine cabinets to address, obviously, the whole, oh, well, to, uh, I mean, I guess, um, be a part of, uh, the effort to combat opioid So there are abuse. two things. One is is that uh, the state does have take back programs with pharmacies, but we also will collect it uh, at all of our safe disposal events. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's tricky because the chain of custody is, <coughs> is um, pretty rigid in terms of the handling. Uh, so that is where we take back mm. drugs of any kind, but then you can usually return them to pharmacies as well. Thank you. Thank you, public advocate. Um, and Commissioner, I just want to thank you for your thorough uh, testimony. Um, I'm going to. There'll be a quiz. Uh, <laughs> well, I have questions here. And I'm, I'm going through the testimony to reference the questions. And I don't want you to repeat yourself. So um, I'm going to be limited. So I'm going to just ask about uh, a couple of things that I think are important. I want to get my colleagues to, to uh, ask questions. The plastic bags issue. Mm -hmm. um, so can we just talk about the efforts we're making to reduce the pa plastic bag use? Um, and after the fee was delayed, what work alternatively did uh, the Department of Sanitation do uh, to try to deal with this issue? And the reusable bags, um, are, are they still being hand it out, or is it something that those are very popular? So I just want to know if we can just get an update on the plastic bag Certainly. situation. Thank you. So obviously, you're aware that after the great work that the council did, you were preempted. Um, and you know, I think that we were hopeful that the report that came out uh, would lead to a path forward. Instead, it really was just sort of a series of options of which uh, the legislature at the state level have not taken any action. Um, so we have been diligently providing uh, many of our reusable bags. We are over 400,000 bags have been given out in the city of New York, and we continue to do that to spread the word. Uh, and you actually start to see them now all over the place, which you know is heartening, uh, because every time someone remembers to bring it, it is a bunch of plastic that we therefore do not have in our waste stream. Um, but it is challenging politically uh, at the moment. Uh, so, you know, we are hopeful that with the change in the state Senate that we might begin to see movement again on this issue. Okay. And, and I do want to say that we had some issues in the state assembly as well, believe it or not, even from some of our, you know, more progressive members. So it's just, a, it's going to be a tough one long term. I just want to know that we're still working to try our best to educate folks on the uh, dangers and the challenges that plastic bags pose so we can start having an, a reaction, I guess, or an action to it. No, abs I mean, absolutely. But I mean, this is, this is what we know from other cities is that if you do a fee of any kind, you get more participation. 
Um, so we are doing what we can with it being a voluntary action to bring your reusable bag, but we are certainly making every effort to uh, provide people with access to reusable bags. I just want to, I guess, not quote, but uh, Councilmember Lori Cumble was convinced to support the plastic bag fee when she saw how effective the fee for the Metro card was, uh, and we practically stick with the same Metro card now and before they were being thrown away they were uh, all over the floor everywhere and now everyone keeps a, it, it's not an issue no one has a problem with it and it hasn't affected any large population whether you're poor or rich you just stick with your card mm -hmm. um, so just showing that fees can change behavior uh, more so than anything else and not cause a burden onto 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 right. people um, can we identify what cannot be diverted from landfill? What no. is it that we, c there's nothing we can do about it, it's gonna go to landfill? Well, I'm not sure that there's nothing, we haven't come up with a plan. Like for example, um, diapers and hygienic products are a relatively large portion of the waste stream, they're about 4.2% of the waste stream. Um, and at this point, we <laughs> don't have a plan for them. Um, there are non-designated uh, plastics such as styrofoam, which make up 5.5% of the waste stream, but we are obviously going after styrofoam as of January 1st. Uh, carpeting and upholstery is a chunk of that, and we are hopeful there's some extended producer responsibility bills that have been floating around that we're hoping to uh, work towards having enacted. Can you, uh, can you just clarify producer responsibility? Certainly. Is that a state or federal? Like, who... who well, you, anyone, any, any, it tends to mainly happen at the state level. And what it is, is similar to the bottle bill, where the manufacturers uh, are responsible for ensuring that at the end of the life of their product, their product has somewhere to go. Um, and in, it's used much, much, much more extensively in Europe than it is here. Uh, so it actually forces the manufacturer of the products or the packager to, to think about you know, as you put it together, how are you going to take it apart? Uh, and so they've been very effective at both reducing overall waste and making things easier to recycle. Um, so that is one of the, we know has been floating around at the state level for a while, uh, and so has paint uh, stewardship bills. So, but that's, those are some of the products. Uh, also construction and demolition material, so obviously if a contractor does work on your home, they are responsible for it, but if you do it yourself, then we will collect it, uh, so that's another chunk of material. So there, there are some that are, that are still challenging, um, but you know, I, th I think that we want to continue to think creatively. Some of those are easier than others. So in your testimony, you went through Donate NYC, Refashion NYC, the electronic waste, harmful household products. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, while I see that we have an initiative uh, to take on those challenges, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I, I can't sit here com feeling comfortable that what we're doing is going to be enough to significantly get us to a place where we're closer to zero waste by 2030. Um, and I, I believe uh, a big part of that is education and mm -hmm. information not getting out to the public. I just want to, I know um, during the budget season, I'm going to be requesting that you get a uh, significant increase in your marketing budget mm -hmm. so that we can start uh, really putting, putting the city mm -hmm. on notice about, uh, as to the work that we want to do to get to zero waste. Um, so can you, can you just let us know, we had initiatives before, like the Save As You Throw program, which we haven't seen move forward. Can we just talk about what it is we're thinking about doing that can get us there and whether or not we're on track? Certainly, so obviously uh, we do agree with you that having a marketing budget would be useful uh, and we are starting to put together the bones of what an RFP might look like for that since obviously procurement is a very long process in the city of New York. Um, because we do think we need to continually get the word out about waste and opportunities and programs that we do have for people to make use of. Um, you know, there, 
there are tools in the toolbox, and obviously ones that are uh, that we have been implementing have been primarily on the voluntary side. I think if we are going to actually meet our goals, it'll be a question of whether or not we want to take on some things that are more challenging and um, really going to be able to drive that in, in some which politically may not be the most comfortable thing to do. So in short, politics is holding you back. <laughs> Isn't it always? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, hope, I hope my politics are not. So... Um, no, I, so I appreciate that answer. I think people need to hear, you know, the challenges that we're going through and trying to achieve zero waste by 2030. Um, we have a lot of folks that talk about climate change and the need to protect the earth and the environment. But when it comes to doing the aggressive things that are necessary to get us there um, like this, it, it goes over their head, right? This is not the fancy Green New Deal. So maybe people are not as encouraged or as motivated to be helpful. but. Um, one, I think, again, with education, mm -hmm. we can get more people involved and motivated. So I'll do my part um, as well to push that. I want to allow for my colleagues to, to ask a few questions. Uh, Councilmember Espinel first is going to be followed by Councilmember Deutsch. Oh, whoa, whoa. I had no idea I was first. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, it's a pleasure seeing you. Uh, I, I have I think it's two questions. Mm -hmm. One, um, something that I saw... Uh, recently, and uh, maybe I, I was hallucinating when I saw this, but it was early 6 a.m. Sanitation truck was in front of my house picking up the trash uh, and recyclables. Um, I thought what I saw was the the sanitation worker dumping the, the plastic ba uh, plastic my plastic recyclables into the same trash as as the overall trash. Is there any instances where that might happen, or maybe I was seeing things, or? Or yeah. maybe they were just doing the wrong maybe thing. Maybe doing the wrong thing, right. <laughs> yes. No, there are certainly instances where sanitation workers do the wrong thing. Uh, ho thankfully, based on the tonnage numbers, it's rare that that would happen. But if you see it again, please let me know. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, it's good to know. You can actually even tell me today <laughs> if you remember the date and I can. Yeah, I don't remember. It was okay. actually a, like a month or two ago. Um, and then second question, we I, I did pass uh, that bill that would create that food waste portal that you mentioned mm -hmm. in your testimony. Yes. Um, last year, can you give me more of an update and tell me more of how it's going to work and what where what the design is like and how businesses and nonprofits can play a role in using it? Oh, certainly. It? I mean, so really, it's it's a matching, and I'll let I'll let Deputy Commissioner Anderson speak more to it. But it's it's similar in structure to our current donate site, uh, but we're excited about it, and so it's also how to make it sort of streamlined and people understand what's allowed and what's not allowed. Uh, so I'm excited to have uh, perhaps uh, an event come March, if it's not snowing. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're very excited about it, and we've been seeing some updates on the on the we're beta testing it right now with some potential donors and potential recipients. And one of the things we didn't want to do was. Um, add bureaucracy to things that already work well. So City Harvest, Food Bank already have very effective portals for a lot of their food. So the question was how do we tackle the food that's not getting captured already? And one of the primary points is to do hyper-local connections of food. So we have somebody who's curating donors who have food to donate where they're located and the recipients and where they're located to see how close, how closely located are there and could there be informal um, arrangements made within a neighborhood even to connect don donated food and re recipient food. So we have a, a front end portal for donors and recipients to sign up different types of food categories they can say they're interested in. We are very much supportive of nutritional eating and eating in this process. Um, and then we have an administrative portal where we're actually physically curating matches. And, and one of the focuses is how do we do this in a hyper-local way, less traffic, um, and create those personal neighborhood connections. So what, what type of businesses will be able to participate in this? You know, I have a lot of catering halls and all these other folks who, who find this to be an attractive option. Absolutely. So any, and this actually helps too if you are required to separate your food scraps for composting, you can also <coughs> remove some of those food scraps or um, leftover food um, through donations as well. Um, so any business that has leftover food can sign up we hope they will register for the portal. When you have excess food available, you, you put it on the portal. We try to do matches as quickly as possible. So if there's perishable food and um, 
in the connection, there's a discussion that happens about who can deliver, who's picking up, you know, how that works, and what the capacities are of the recipient and of the donor. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and just, Commissioner, I just want to thank you. Uh, I know that the compost program was put on pause for a while, uh, but you were accommodating enough to get us a trash bin in East New York, so uh, we're very grateful. Thank you. Organic. It's an organic, but it's not a trash. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a food scrap drop-off. So. Yes. It's amazing. Thank you. So I'm glad to hear that as well. Uh, Council Member Heim Deutsch, also from Brooklyn. Brooklyn is well represented here today. And the Bronx. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to ask you, Commissioner, uh, in regards to uh, senior citizens and people with disabilities, so how can we better accommodate um, these individuals when um, many are receiving tickets from sanitation departments. Like I have a constituent, for example, who has a uh, prosthetic leg, and his aide leaves before, um, let's say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then the trash needs to be put out, like, let's say, after 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. After depends. 4. Yeah. And so when they put it out sooner, um, then... It's a violation. It's a violation. Uh, and this has become an uh, issue in my district, and... How could we um, tackle this, maybe through legislation or maybe through um, uh, working with sanitation, letting them know of certain addresses that people are having difficulties to putting out the trash um, at, the, at the pivot time? It's, it's been happening uh, quite often to several individuals in my district who are disabled. Right. No, I mean, I think that this is challenging because we they, it is actually specifically a rule that it has to be after 4 o'clock. Yeah, there is it's, not discretion. it's even more challenging for right, a person. But there is not discretion for the enforcement agent uh, to not write the ticket if they see it. Uh, we can talk about how we can be helpful in terms of that in, in different ways, but the one thing I would not want to see is the reason we want it out after 4 o'clock is that we don't want it to sit on the curb for an excessive period of time. Um, and so the longer it's out there, it's, it's a problem for attracting vermin. Um, but we can sit down and certainly talk through specifically how many people you're having it, are having issues with this and uh, look at what uh, we can do going forward. Okay. Is there anything that you could think of now? No, no. there's not. I mean, like, because it, it it's pretty rigid. There's not enforcement discretion on this particular piece. Uh, it the says it's – like, we actually – did a, a, a very specific rule. It used to be a policy, um, and then that changed so that now it's uh, it's a rule in the city of New York. Do you believe it's a, it could be an issue for people, uh, for seniors? Well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, you know, my mother's 78 years old. She doesn't have a problem getting making sure that she's complying with what the rules are yeah, of the city I'm, of New I'm York. I'm talking about someone that has a home care attendant or has an aide. So... If that home care attendant leaves at a certain hour where the person cannot possibly uh, pull out the trash, that's I'm talking about in those circumstances. I Not feel like that's a very unique set of circumstances. Yeah, it's so unique, we should really we have, should talk about that. You have uh, tens of thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of uh, people with disability in our city, and we have uh, a lot of seniors. So from there's a percentage that cannot pull out their own trash. So they would have uh, maybe the aide or a neighbor who would pull it out for them, but it doesn't always go out after four o'clock. So you have that you have that percentage. I'm not talking I'm not talking about someone who could do it on their own. Thank 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 God they could do it on their own. But I'm talking about those who can't. Right, we can certainly discuss it in okay. the future. And thank you. And I want to just give a shout out to Henry who's been uh, really amazing and very responsive, 24, 24 hours a day. I know. <laughs> As you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I wanted to just, it, it seems like we're doing, doing everything. I don't know if we're doing everything to the level that we need to do it. Um, how, how are we tying it back into the zero waste conversation? How, how are we making sure that everything we do um, speaks to how we're getting to zero waste. Is, do you have an internal document that shows us how we're going to achieve zero waste and that everything we're doing is contributing to get there? Or are you kind of, or is everyone in the Department of Sanitation, uh, depending on which initiative, working almost like in silos, just trying to do their best to get their silo down to zero? I um, just want to just, how it's, 
together. So, I mean, internally, obviously, we have people who are assigned to specific programs. Um, but also internally, there's the overall metrics, which we really look at is how much waste are we sending still to landfills. And so that is our, our benchmark. That is what we are driving against. Uh, and so that's the big number uh, at the end of the day. Is that coming down? Um, is the, is are the tons of recyclables going up? And we're very careful to try and document what we know. Uh, and so th they all with internally understand, and perhaps this is one of the, the things we need to do in terms of getting the message out, how their pieces fit into the overall pie of driving down uh, to zero waste. So now, uh, the public advocates bill. Mm -hmm. uh, City Hall, we heard, has a terrible does a terrible job, terrible job at uh, putting their organics in the bin and doing what they're supposed to do. They have a very low return. Either they eat all their organics, all their lunch is eaten, and they're extremely efficient, or we're just not doing a good job in City Hall. So I, I just could guess um, how you think we can, I guess, the level of achievement that we can get with this program and piloting it um, and make which buildings will you pilot? Which ones are you looking to, to take on so that eventually we can get every city city building doing doing their part? All right, no, certainly. I mean, I think this is still something where uh, perhaps we have to do some education at City Hall uh, to deepen our engagement there. Uh, I think Tish specifically wrote, on the bill specifically wrote, City Hall has to be one of the buildings. Well, well, we we will we will continue to work with both your side and the other side of the uh, of the building uh, to make sure that we're <laughs> that we are getting um, you know it's possible that everyone's eating everything it's unlikely but it's possible uh, that we are getting um, the diversion that we would expect uh, in that building but I think we want to look at a variety of sizes like if you're in an office building. Um, you know, that is large, uh, like how would you do it there? Like what would be your approach? Um, you know, there there are very different scopes of, of buildings that uh, I think that we can look at across all five boroughs. So um, we have not picked specifically any buildings, but uh, we wanna see, you know, does when you go in and you're talking to the Department of Health, is that different than when you're talking to the city council? Um, and how do we change our messaging, or do they have a cafeteria, or do they not have a cafeteria? Um, are most people bringing in their food? Are most people going out to lunch? I think that those play a role in what you would expect uh, coming out of this. Um, is, it, is it unusual that we haven't had those conversations already, or that we haven't put forth those models that would be ideal in city sites? Um, so we can get there, and uh, once we do get that done in these city buildings, that we can use it as a model for private buildings and so forth, and expand on that. Um, you know, it, I, I wish it wouldn't have taken legislation to kind of get there. So can you just like, can we talk about that? Oh sure. I mean, uh, obviously, we always appreciate the advocacy of the public advocate on this. Um, we do have agencies are required to do recycling plans. Um, and so we do engage with them that way. Uh, I think that our focus has been more on the, um, in the commercial sector, more on where there's food preparation and food activities occurring, just because of the volume. And then in the private sec in the residential sector, you know that people are either cooking or like that there's more food prep activities. Um, and it's also why we were doing schools, though they don't seem to cook that much anymore, but that's why we were doing schools as a, as a big push. But uh, we, we certainly should have been come to you earlier to have this conversation because I do think it's important that city agencies show that they can walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah, it would be good. we should set the example, I agree 100%. Uh, public advocate Tish James. So in schools where, you know, I was part of the um, effort to expand universal school lunch. So with school lunch, with breakfast, um, and I think there's a snack. Um, you're saying that there's less and less cooking. It's all prepackaged and- It's a lot of prepackaged. 
Um, it's it's a lot of prepackaged in the schools these days. Uh, yeah, know, breakfast in your classroom's been challenging. <laughs> yes, because uh, it's a little bit easier when they go to the cafeteria in terms of setup uh, and those things. But you know, we continue to work closely with school food mm -hmm. uh, and with the custodians to try and make sure that we're getting it right. And you know, they did make a big push and got rid of styrofoam yeah. several years ago, which was huge. Yeah, um, and that has made a big difference. You said something interesting which caught my attention. You mentioned that as part of our waste stream and which has been challenging is the disposal of um, feminine products and pampers. There's no biodegradable products on the market? In Not that people are using. So? it's. I mean, that is just, uh, there, there's a lot of plastic in, in diapers and usually there's quite a bit of non-recyclable material in feminine care products as well. There are um, there are some very very expensive <laughs> mm. biodegradable products that aren't that don't perform very well. Mm. So the challenge I think is is one between you know product performance and you know during the use of the product versus sort of the end of its life. And we're we're constantly looking at what products are out there. You know the pros and cons of of the different ones. But right now and there are, you know people can use cloth <coughs> diapers, but again right. there's an expense to having those things cleaned, et cetera. So. So I think the challenge is that, that we don't have the right solution yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there certainly are companies working on it. And is there, does the city have a relationship with some of these major corporations, one, to talk about this issue, and two, to talk about packaging? So we don't have necessarily direct relationships with them, but we have been working in concert with things like the Closed Loop Fund uh, to meet with, like, the Unilevers of the world and, uh, <laughs> and put a little bit of pressure on them because yeah. they will say, you know, we're doing 20% post-consumer. And I was like, well, that's not enough. Uh, you need to help create the market for the materials that you use. Right. Uh, we don't have a tremendous amount of leverage beyond the bully pulpit, uh, but we are trying to make sure that we're having the connection so where uh, we can have an impact, we will. Um, and using the power of municipalities together to have that conversation. Uh, there is clearly a lot of interest, particularly coming out of Europe, where there's more pressure on the big multinationals to think through their product design and end of life. Uh, there's just not the same legislation here as there is in other places. I do know that we passed a bill, I believe, last year, um, basically requiring that all, I think, shelters, and I think shelters, we would be providing um, residents um, free, uh, I think, diapers, or pampers and feminine products. Mm -hmm. um, how are we, it, as part of the RFP, was the issue with respect to recycling part of the? I can't answer that, but mm -hmm. I mean, I, w I would say that probably the issue is the performance of the product. Mm -hmm. um, and cost. Well, and cost. And I mean, the, as, as Deputy Commissioner Anderson mentioned, you could use cloth diapers. I have to say, it was many, many moons ago, uh, I found them very ineffective. Uh, so it was my intention to try and do that, but uh, it didn't actually work out very well. What worked for my grandmother and my mother can work for the nation. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Public Advocate. And Commissioner, thank you for your time. I um, appreciate you coming in and helping us out. I just, I, I would I'd like to say that I just feel like we're kind of running through the motions here when it comes to a lot of this stuff, and I'm just hoping we could hit a you know, break through uh, a wall here and really start seeing these numbers drop in a significant way. But um, I do th thank you for your time and your great work. So thank you. And Bridget, thank you so much for being here as well. We have one panel. Um, Adriana Espinosa from the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, Justin Wood from NOPI. Greg Todd, Community Carding and Composting. And Eric Goldstein from NRDC, the National Resource Defense Council. <laughs>
Eric, I'm going to have you start. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Eric Goldstein, New York City Environment Director with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for your continuing leadership and for calling this hearing. Managing organic, uh, the organics waste stream, food waste and yard waste, is the most important, the most important residential trash initiative launched by the de Blasio administration. Simply stated, it's going to be impossible for New York City to hold itself out as a national leader in sustainability if it can successfully manage its food waste and yard waste properly. Organics represents the single largest portion of the residential waste stream, more than 30%, according to the city's most recent uh, waste characterization study. Most of the organics now goes to landfills or incinerators where they're burned, uh, where they're buried and generate methane, a very potent global warming gas, as you know. So unless the administration is able to implement a better solution, it will never, ever be able to achieve its zero waste goals or its equally ambitious climate reduction, climate uh, warming reduction goals. And under the current approach, it'll waste valuable resources. On the commercial side, as you know, uh, there remains excess food that could and should be repurposed and diverted to food banks, et cetera. And for both commercial and residential organics, uh, these materials can be converted into valuable compost and biogas. Over time, directing organics from away from landfills and incinerators can also save taxpayer dollars, as the experience in cities that have implemented mandatory programs like San Francisco have demonstrated. Uh, Sanitation Commissioner Garcia has recognized these facts. On her very first day in office, she pledged to make the department a national leader in sustainability and specifically highlighted the need for separated collection of compostables from s for city residents. And to her credit and the department's credit, the organics collection program launched in the Bloomberg administration has been greatly expanded under her leadership. The DSNY program now is already available to over one million city households. But earlier this year, the continued expansion of the organics collection program to new city neighborhoods was halted, apparently due to city hall budget cutbacks. This decision is most short-sighted and must be reversed. Expansion of this program, along with comprehensive education and outreach efforts, are essential if the city's basic sustainability goals are to be achieved. Public advocate Tish James has also recognized the importance of better handling of the organics waste stream. Last year, she proposed legislation that would require all city agency buildings to participate in the city's organics waste recycling program. This makes perfect sense, and that legislation was strongly supported by NRDC. As public advocate James wrote, our public servants should be the leaders on this issue and help our city towards greater sustainability and responsibility. Training over 300,000 municipal employees to separate food waste by composting is needed, she wrote, to propel a cultural shift throughout the city and improve the efficiency of the organics program. Unfortunately, public advocate James's sensible original proposal was apparently too much for some short-sighted city hall officials. The amended version of this legislation, intro 1075A, would establish a pilot program mandating that at least 15 billions o buildings occupied by city agencies and at least three boroughs participate in organics pilot demonstration program beginning in July 2019. We don't need any demonstration programs. We know that this strategy works. Nevertheless, NRDC supports intro 1075A. Even a small step forward is significant when public policy is turning in the wrong direction but much, much more is needed. The City Council has led New York on solid waste issues in general and composting in particular in recent years. Both the residential and commercial programs now underway owe much to the City Council legislation passed in 2013, and your leadership has advanced not only this issue, but many others on the solid waste se scene. But now is the time, once again, for comprehensive City Council action on this issue. We urge the Council to advance legislation in 2019 that would direct DSNY to implement a citywide mandatory organics collection program by December 2020. The commissioner and the department could implement such a program, the public would support such a program, and we challenge the administration to tell us how it will ever meet its zero waste goals without such a program serving every city neighborhood. Thanks for your listening and for your continued leadership. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. 
I'm Ms. Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you to Chair Reynoso for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, the New York League of Conservation Voters supports the passage of Intro 1075A, sponsored by public advocate James. Uh, diverting waste from landfills, organic waste from landfills, is a critical component of the city's zero waste goal. And organics represents the largest category of waste at 34% of the overall waste stream. The waste emit, emits large quantities of methane, a potent greenhouse gas that is harmful to our environment, but can otherwise be recycled to become compost or even clean energy. Reaching the Zero by 30 goal established in 1NYC will require work from all New Yorkers, cooperation from city officials and private industry, and buy-in from the general public. And, is the, and as is the case for all of our ambitious sustainability goals, the city should be leading the way, going f farther, faster, than they are expecting of everyday New Yorkers. As of fiscal year 2017, curbside recycling rates for approximately 17.5%. While this is an increase um, of 2005 levels, it's moving far too slowly to reach the 2030 benchmark. More aggressive actions are necessary to get us on track to zero by, th by 30, and the city can and must lead by example to achieve these goals. While we wish the bill went further, a pilot program to expand the organics program to city agencies and special use buildings is still a positive step forward. If this bill is adopted, we strongly encourage the department to make the pilot available to as many city agencies as practicable with an eye towards expanding to all city agencies and institutional special use buildings served by DSNY. Further, NYLCV hopes that the outreach and education conducted pursuant to intro 1075A will be used to inform the department of best practices to expand into a citywide outreach program on recycling. For these reasons, the New York League of Conservation Voters supports the passage of uh, intro 1075A and we urge the city council to pass this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, Thank you, Chair Reynoso, for holding this hearing, and thank you to Public Advocate James for sponsoring this legislation. My name is Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Organizing and Strategic Research at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And I'm going to start by largely echoing uh, the comments of my colleagues in the environmental movement. Uh, with every international and federal report finding that we've entered a period of accelerating climate change and climate-related social crisis, it's imperative that our local government do everything in its power to reduce greenhouse emissions, including emissions from landfilling of organic waste. So while we thank the public advocate for introducing this bill, uh, we're really disappointed that this is such a limited pilot and, and it's, it's surprising that we're not moving forward with a, uh, a much more aggressive bill to ensure that all city buildings uh, participate in organics recycling. Uh, we urge DSNY to go beyond the bare minimum uh, in this bill and, and rapidly ramp up to recy organics recycling service to a larger number of municipal buildings as soon as possible. However, as a pilot program, this bill is a small step in the right direction that can set the stage for a much bolder expansion of both municipal and commercial organics recycling across the city for three reasons. First, by encouraging our huge city workforce to participate in waste diversion at work, we also promote organics recycling at home and in our communities. Thousands of municipal employees and New Yorkers visiting these municipal buildings can become ambassadors for organics recycling. Second, by increasing the volumes of source-separated organic waste along DSNY collection routes, this measure may enable some of these routes to become more efficient and cost-effective. Both the collection and processing of organic waste via composting and anaerobic digestion creates si significantly more jobs than exporting waste to landfills or incineration and should be viewed as a source of green job development for the NYC region. And part of our Green New Deal that hopefully we're going to be working towards on all fronts. Third, organic waste collection from municipal buildings can also serve as a model and testing ground for similar types of buildings in NYC's huge commercial sector, which lags far behind other cities in recycling and organics recycling. As you know, uh, DSNY and the City Council um, are preparing to implement a zoned waste collection system which will be a historic reform of the private waste system and require private haulers to meet disposal reduction targets consistent with the city's zero waste goals and to provide accurate and transparent data about quantities collected and recycled. And I want to pause and also thank uh, the public advocate for her support of this uh, historic policy and, and her staff's participation in that process as well. 
because the zoned commercial waste system will enable DSNY to have far more oversight and involvement in commercial recycling programs, comparisons between municipal buildings and commercial buildings could enable the agency to test employee education programs, contamination levels, and diversion rates to find best practices as both recycling programs expand. I'll just close by noting that the city's one NYC plan calls for a 90% reduction of disposed waste from both the DSNY managed waste stream and the commercial sector by 2030, which necessitates major growth in organics recycling participation in both sectors over the next 10 years. When we face the stark reality of the climate crisis, cities like New York will need to do a lot more to achieve major greenhouse gas emissions reductions across every sector, including waste management, as quickly as possible. In conclusion, we hope the pilot program in intro 1075A is viewed as a small but important precursor to a much larger transformation of our city's waste systems. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Councilmember uh, Reynoso, for this opportunity to testify and to Tish James for sponsoring this uh, innovative legislation. My name is Greg Todd. I am um, the co-founder of a Community Carting and Composting. And uh, we are a community-based microcarter in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. As revealed in the 2017 waste characterization study conducted by the Sanitation Department, about one-third of the waste generated by New York City residents is organics. Given that the city generates about 11,000 tons per day of commercial waste, that means that it sends into landfills approximately 3,300 tons of organics per day from offices and businesses. Plan 1NYC states that the city's goal is to have zero recyclables in the landfill by 2030. If the city has any hope of achieving this lofty goal in just 12 years, it needs to begin at home with its own offices. As sanitation increases the requirements for on businesses to divert organics, and in fact is issuing fines for those that don't, it will indeed cause considerable consternation among businesses to be fined for not composting organics when they know the city isn't doing its fair share in its own offices. We at Community Carding feel the best place for the city to compost organics is locally, at locally owned and operated community resource recovery facilities. These facilities, such as BK Rock, Big Reuse, Earth Matter, and Red Hook Composting, process organics locally not at distant facilities reachable only by long truck trips. By operating locally in our communities, we keep the jobs and products of composting such as soil amendments right here in New York City. Further, because offices are not large generators of food waste, the amounts generated could be taken to the local processing facilities by microcarters such as community carting and, and composting. The net result will be green jobs in our communities and fewer truck trips. We at Community Carding and Compost stand ready to serve the needs of the city's offices. Let us know how we can help. I would like to further add that I think the consensus of many is that part of the problem in our low recycling rates is the lack of education. And uh, one of the efforts, I'm also the chair of the Organics Committee at the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board, and we are now collaborating with the Manhattan and the Queens Solid Waste Advisory Board to have an organics Earth Day town hall meeting. And we are, have been actively working on that and will probably be held at the Brooklyn Borough Hall. And we're going to look at uh, thinking outside the box and educating people in the community about some of the other things that they could do to get involved in organics composting. So more on that soon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Please let me know. I would love to partner and be helpful in that effort. And you know, I hear the entire panel um, in unison talking about this not being enough. I will engage with the commissioner to make sure that the pilot program is just that and that we have a plan to more aggressively go after all the city buildings, um, which should be a goal that they should have anyway. Um, I don't think that would be too much of a challenge. Um, but I really appreciate your testimony and your time today, and thank you for all the work that you do. So thank you very much. Um, we uh, are adjourned. Thank you so much.